A very good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it's amazing to see so many people here. I'm sure all the dealers outside are completely furious, uh, but we're delighted uh, to have you all here today. Um, this is the last, it's gone by so quickly, but this is the last of the Freeze Masters talks this year. Um, over the last few days, we've brought together a group of wonderful artists with the directors and curators of the great historical museums of the world. The last two conversations on Wednesday and Thursday were complete blind dates. The curators and the artists didn't really know each other. This is not the case today. Um, Edmund and Paulus have met several times uh, and they are cooking up a project together which um, they're going to be talking about to you today. Just a brief introduction. In 1969, an amazing lady called Dominique de Menil invited the 41-year-old Andy Warhol to curate an exhibition from the storage vaults of Rice University in Houston and RISD, the Rhode Island School of Design. Warhol created, curated an extraordinary exhibition called Raid the Icebox, which was one of the first times that an artist was let loose with the collections of an institution. Around the same time, the National Gallery in London were planning uh, what became a, a, a really extraordinarily important series of exhibitions called The Artist's Eye, where they invited Leon Kossoff, Frank Auerbach, Francis Bacon, Lucien Freud, Bridget Riley, Kitai, to choose their favorite works from the collection and present them. So artists have always, over the last 50 years, been increasingly engaged as curators within museum collections as well. And the challenge for the artists is to present unfamiliar aspects of very familiar works and reveal aspects of their own working practice at the same time. And the challenge for us as an audience is to match our eye to theirs and to follow this vision. The museum that I work in in Vienna, the Kunsthistorisches Museum, we began a series of exhibitions three years ago. We invited the American artist Ed Ruscha uh, to come sift through hundreds of thousands of objects in the collection in Vienna and choose his favorite objects from the collection. He put together an extraordinary exhibition called The Ancients Stole All Our Great Ideas. This took place in uh, 2011 in the autumn. And then it was, it was great fun and we learned a lot from it. And then my attention turned to the, to the next project and the next person, who would be the right person to do this. And Edmund's name popped up very, very quickly. And I picked up the telephone in the summer of the following year and asked Edmund if he would like to do this. And he said yes, uh, to my delight, and to today to all of your delight as well. So, Paulus Reiner, the uh, curator from the Kunstkammer in Vienna at the Kunsthistorisches Museum, will be talking with Edmund. I'm going to give this gentleman no introduction. Um, the fact that you're all here means that that is not required. So, thank you all very much for coming. Paulus and Edmund, over to you. Thank you, Jasper. Uh, good afternoon. And yeah, I have to say, I'm quite excited to, to be here to talk to Edmund. Uh, and what we, I think we both don't know uh, what exactly will come out during this talk, but we have some sort of uh, red line. What I would try to do is uh, to give you a very brief five minute introduction into the meaning of a Kunstkammer and the history of our collection. Going then on talking about the project uh, which Edmund is doing next year and which will be uh, held in 2016 in the Kunsthistorisches Museum. And after that, we will try to have a conversation of s on, on, on some uh, outstanding objects. So the idea of a Kunstkammer uh, which is literally, literally translated means art cabinets or yeah, sometimes translated also with curiosity cabinets, increased in the last decades not only as object of scholarship but only as uh, a, a remarkable had, uh, impact on display practices and on contemporary artists as well as you can see uh, on the frieze here as well. Uh, but the principle, this principle of collecting and displaying natural objects, historical objects, scientific objects, technical objects, and combining them, them with uh, works of art 
can be traced back to the mid of the 16th century. Uh, by combining all those fields, which today are uh, separated into different disciplines, uh, one should be led to a deeper understanding of the world, to, to uh, get a really deep understanding how or what makes the world go round, so to say. And this is not only a two-day's interpretation of this concept, but it's, it's, it's recorded as early as 1565, when Samuel Kickeberg, uh, advisor to the Munich court, uh, formulated in his first treaty on, on museum, I'm quoting this because, just because it's so beautiful, that uh, he says that all those things should, should be brought together so that by their frequent viewing and handling, one might quickly, easily, and confidently be able to acquire a unique knowledge and admirable understanding of things. So that was an idea that a Kunstkammer, that a collection as this, should be a kind of a walkable encyclopedia, uh, picturing the whole world within a separated room uh, concentrated, really concentrated on that. The first Kunstkammer in Vienna to be mentioned was the one of Emperor Ferdinand I, uh, which is mentioned al already in the 1550s, and his successors as emperors and his uh, nephews and so on as archdukes had their own Kunstkammers as well. They were very often embedded into a wider concept uh, comprising also botanical, zoological gardens, laboratories, observatories. And this was, by the way, we just talked about it, by the way, a concept which Francis Bacon suggested to Queen Elizabeth I of England, but without any success. So there could be a Kunstkammer even today in England, uh, made up in the 16th century. Unfortunately, we don't have any um, any uh, contemporary images of uh, one of the um, Habsburg Kunstkammers, uh, but the basis of our today's collection is uh, two Kunstkammers, the one of Archduke Ferdinand II, which uh, was held in Ambras Castle, and the second one, very important one, the Kunstkammer of Rudolf, Emperor Rudolf II, which was housed in Prague. Um, of course, those historical Kunstkammers cam had a different composition as our collection today is composed. Uh, this is mainly caused by the Age of Enlightenment, when disciplines were separated from each other, and so also the, the uh, imperial collections were separated, singling out uh, natural objects which are kept today in the Museum of Natural History in, in, in Vienna, singling out um, ethnographical objects as well as books and so on. And uh, so they all were then kept in, 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 um, in own collections. And one of these collections was the so-called Ambras, Ambras Sammlung, the Ambras collection, which has only uh, which was which united works broke from Ambras to in, uh, to Vienna and uh, combined there with treasures from the treasury in Vienna and this collection was opened as early as to the public as early as 1814. Um, finally, in 1891, the Kunst Historisches Museum was built and opened. And uh, it was opened, uh, our collection had, at the time at its opening, the name Collection of Items of Art Industry. This is, of course, caused to uh, this whole idea of, of uh, decorative art. This is a, a picture made around 1900 showing how this collection was installed around 1900. In 2002, our collection had to be closed because its installation no longer conformed to international standards of conservation, presentation, security, and so on. And we had the opportunity to build a new Kunstkammer. And last year, finally, we 
were able to reopen our collection with a complete refurbishment, expansion of spaces, as well as a redisplay and modern presentation of the objects and the collection. It's basically it's formed into three sections, starting with a focus on uh, princely concepts of collecting, uh, from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance, going on then to the era, era of uh, the Kunstkammer. Here you see the room which is dedicated to Emperor Rudolf II. Rudolf II himself standing in the center of his collection, surrounded by the objects he uh, collected. Yeah, and just to give you a brief, I will just flip through these objects, a uh, brief uh, idea of which objects are kept in our collection. The famous uh, salt cellar Saliera made by Benvenuto Cellini in between 1540 and yeah. And the great unknown thing about this salt cellar, if I can interrupt, is that it's on wheels. So actually <coughs> the idea is that you can move it around and suddenly Cellini moving across a table is the most extraordinary idea. Go on, yeah. go on. So things in action, but we'll get there. Things in action, which you can see on the yeah. first view. Yeah. And that's also something yeah. which is very important for Kunstkammer objects. Or this um, wooden sculpture made around 1470, 1480s uh, by Jörg Sirlin in Ulm in Germany. It's ob obviously, it's a subject, uh, the subject is, is trans-science, trans um, having a young couple and the old woman. Same idea. We've heard yesterday about uh, the Fury Master, the Master of the Furies. This is one uh, ivory sculpture uh, made by this unknown master in Salzburg around 1610-20s. Depicting the mystic bird, Phoenix, which burns and the, at the end of his life and arises from the ashes. So that's same idea again, but we have also some some scientific uh, devices like or like clocks and automata. This is the so-called first rolling ball clock um, made by Christoph Mark Graf in 1596 uh, in Prague. And uh, let's see what's next. Ah, yeah, and then. We will come to the project which Edmund is doing with us in the museum. Well, I mean, it's an extraordinary thing. I mean, you can see. I mean, it's, it's Vienna, which is troublesome. It's an incredible museum. It's vast beyond any, any belief. It's, uh, the ceilings are enough to die for. Uh, they come down on you like this. Um, and the objects, I mean, working with a Kunstkammer. So how do you start to work with the Kunsthistorische? Um, and so this invitation to kind of raid the icebox, a Venetian icebox, um, is quite a scary one for me. And so really it begins here um, with opening this extraordinary book, the Kunstbuch of Dürer, um, and opening it and finding this extraordinary image. Uh, in 1525, this is a watercolour um, and, 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 a, and a diary entry of Dürer. In 1525, during the night between Wednesday and Thursday after Whitsuntide, I had this vision in my sleep and saw how many great waters fell from heaven. The first struck the ground about four miles away from me with such a terrible force, enormous noise and splashing that it drowned the entire countryside. I was so greatly shocked at this, this that I woke before the cloudburst. Some of the waters fell some distance away and some close by. I awoke, my whole body trembled and I could not recover for a long time. And when I arose in the morning, I painted the above as I had seen it. May the Lord turn all things to the best. It's extraordinary, it's a nightmare. It's um, an apocalypse, it's um, the end of the world. Um, and here in this album of engravings and miscellaneous,